Good morning. Yeah, we're uh, very happy to have uh, uh, in-person and virtual hybrid grand rounds this morning and uh, happy to have Dr. Rebecca Stark uh, presenting on congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, Dr. Stark is uh, did her uh, surgery residency at UCLA, but then we were fortunate to have her do her pediatric surgery uh, fellowship here at UW and Seattle Children's. Um, she went to UC Davis for a time, but then we were lucky in recruiting her back to uh, Seattle Children's Hospital, where she is the director of the uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia program and has developed a multidisciplinary team uh, to take care of these very complex patients and is a strong advocate for the multidisciplinary care of CDH patients. And She's also um, the co-director of our fetal surgery program. So uh, we've been very fortunate to recruit Dr. Stark back with us and I look forward to hearing her talk on the con congenital diaphragmatic hernia program and how it can improve results for children with CDH. Thank you, Dr. Stark. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm pretty excited to be here today. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, and I am hoping that I will convince you at the end of this that we've done a lot of work to try to improve care for these babies, but that there's a lot more that we can do. Um, and throughout this talk, I will be showing you some cute baby photos. And that's because it just happens to be our patient cohort. So um, just giving you a brief overview of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the disease process itself our program, and then I'm going to spend a lot of time focusing on the changes we've made and why we've made them. And then I'm going to show you some metrics to try to prove um, that these changes have been successful. Um, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Ledbetter, who dedicated his career to taking care of these babies. Uh, he was responsible for starting a dedicated CDH clinic at Seattle Children's Hospital over a decade ago and took care of hundreds of babies um, with this disease. He also showed me personally how rewarding it is to take care of this population. So in overview, um, it's considered a rare disease. It's diagnosed prenatally about 70% of the time. So most families know that they're gonna have a baby with congenital diaphragmatic hernia before the baby's born. Usually it's diagnosed in the um, in week 20. Overall mortality is still very high. And this is a national average, but um, nationally mortality is still 30%. It's a complex and high acuity disease with really very high resource utilization. But um, the silver lining to all of this is that survivors have a very high quality of life. And these are some pictures of some recent babies that we've treated. So it's a disease with a very, a very um, variable spectrum of clinical outcomes. We tend to think about CDH in terms of three groupings, mild, moderate, and severe. And um, what I've listed here are some survival rates. These are national survival rates. But for mild CDH, um, the survival is really nearly 100%. And so you can imagine it's almost a different disease entity than the severe situation where survival is actually 0 to 50%. And 50% is really the best, the best number out there for the severe cohort. Uh, I put some pictures that kind of show what it looks like um, when you see an x-ray. So this is a, a, mild, a mild case. You can see the NG tube, the stomach is down. There's still some diaphragm there holding the stomach down. There's no solid organ protruding up into the chest on this one. In a more moderate situation, you'd have more mediastinal shift, as you can see from the NG tube being pushed over to the right side, need a large patch for repair. And then these are some postmortem pictures of um, a severe case. And in the most severe cases, there's usually um, liver, which can be, it can be half or two thirds of the liver up in the chest. You can see no lung on the left side. The mediastinum is shifted way over to the right. And probably there's a little bit of posterior right lung behind that mediastinum, but not much. And so pretty severe hypoplasia. And when you're doing a case for one of these babies, it's often that you see a, a very small, lung on that side that that can look as as severe as that rebecca we're sorry to interrupt but nobody on zoom can see your slides they're in the uh stalled mode sorry guys i just i think it's everybody wants to see those slides do you see anything shared 
we see just the first PowerPoint without any slight advancement. Without, yeah, I'm sorry, without what? It's not, it's not in presentation mode. We're seeing the, the, uh, the work mode for PowerPoint and the very first slide only. Okay. It's not the same thing as what as what Dr. Stark is playing. So stop Thank you, David. Share <laughs> specifically this one. Are you seeing it now? If you swap your presenter and um, notes slides, it'll be better even. He's saying he can see it. Oh, and not the what's on there. The top the second bar that says swap presentation mode or something like that. Gotcha. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, thank you. And can you see the uh us, our faces? No, we just see your slides, which is great. The uh Chest X ray and um, path slides. Okay. They need to see this too. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, so I, I won't re explain this slide, but this is the slide that I was showing to kind of demonstrate mild, moderate, and severe disease. Um, sorry. So why are some of these babies so sick? Um, well, the reason is they actually have a lot of things going on at once. Um, and so there, there's a mechanical component of the disease. That's pretty clear. There's a hole in the diaphragm. It can be small um, and it can be, in it can be very large. Um, the picture on the far right is a type defect, D defect, which is a complete diaphragmatic agenesis. Um, physiologically, there is there are three components to the disease, and these are what really make the baby sick. So there's pulmonary hypoplasia, which is just really, uh, if you think about it, impaired surface area for gas exchange, which can be lethal in its more severe form. Pulmonary hypertension, which most CDH babies um, in the severe cohort have um, very severe pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary maldevelopment. So the actual alveolar capillary complexes are, are maldeveloped. The defect occurs really early on, um, somewhere between four to six weeks gestation, and this is when all of the critical lung development happens. This slide kind of shows the nuances of lung development as you go through gestation, and then birth is here on the right. And I'll skip through some of these, but I, what I just wanted to highlight is that this is really where right now we focus all of our efforts. And in children and babies, they have a, a very exponential potential for lung growth and remodeling that happens from birth to six years, but really is focused between zero and two years of life. And so this is where, this is one of the reasons why ECMO works in these babies. I and mean, these babies are born with very, very tiny lungs, but yet we're able to get them off ECMO. And it's because during that time on ECMO, there's a lot of remodeling, relaxation of the pulmonary, vas pulmonary vasculature and actual lung growth that happens during that time. This is the other part of the story for why we spend so much time and effort in trying to keep these babies' lungs healthy. So avoiding barotrauma and volutrauma during the early periods of life, and then also avoiding anything that would insult the lungs, especially um, in terms of feeding and aspiration. And so these babies have very high rates of aspiration because they're competing between feeding and breathing. And so you'll see a lot of the pictures in, this, in these slides have babies with NG tubes in, and and that's the main reason for that. The other reason for those NG tubes is that nutrition means lung growth. And so we really worry about nutrition in these babies in the, in the long term. Um, this is a very complicated schematic, but I mostly want to just point out that impaired gas exchange happens um, because of this maldevelopment as well. So there's maldevelopment of the alveolar capillary complexes, and this manifests as thickening of this interstitial space um, between the capillaries and alveoli. And, um, and this is part of the reason why they have impaired gas exchange. There are a lot of, there's lots of expressions that are different in, in CDH babies in terms of the types of pneumocytes that are present. And then also kind of the um, hormonal milieu of the vascular endothelium. Mm. 
Now it's not advancing, sorry. There you go. Uh, this is a kind of nice schematic here on the far right for me um, that basically shows very distal muscularization of CDH arteries as compared to normal. And then this is a, a histology picture of a normal lung where you can see an alveolar capillary complex. And really there should be no media. Um, it should just be endothelium and um, alveoli abutting each other. This is a CDH lung and you can see um, the vessel here. There is really profound hypertrophy of the medial wall of the vessels, so much so that oftentimes the lumen is obliterated. Um, and not only is um, not only are these vessels, not only do these vessels have very thick medial walls, but the actual um, responses to normal mediators of vasoconstriction are, are very dynamic and very skewed. And so they have really profound, these vessels have really profound responses to hypoxia and acidosis in a way that normal vessels would not. And so this is why you can get into, you can imagine why you would get into a pulmonary hypertensive crisis that would be very hard to get out of. In the background of, of all of this stuff, the hypoplasia, the maldevelopment, these babies are trying to undergo um, transition from fetal circulation to postnatal circulation. And so because the pulmonary vascular resistance doesn't drop in the normal way or has a delay in the drop, a lot of the shunts stay open in the heart. And one way that we are able to clinically track pulmonary hypertension in a baby is to look at pre and post ductal SATs. And the, that SAT is a, a window into the degree of pulmonary hypertension in that moment because the ductus arteriosus most times stays open. Um, and sometimes we want it to stay open because with profound pulmonary hypertension, you can have right heart failure from the strain of pumping into the heart. And that's kind of a pop-off foul for us. But in times of um, pulmonary hypertensive crisis, you can imagine that a lot of that blood that's shunting, not through the lungs, but past the lungs can make the baby overall um, um, hypoxemic and, um, and acidotic. So in the background of all of these things, you can understand why it would be very important to have a multidisciplinary team taking care of these babies. They're highly complex and their clinical course, at least in the, in the beginning few days, weeks, months is, is highly dynamic. Um, and one tool that really helps us in taking care of these babies is predicting disease severity in, um, in this cohort. And typically we look at prenatal prediction factors, which I'll tell you about in the next slides, but there are also some postnatal prediction tools that we can use to help us determine how severe and how sick babies are gonna be. We use this um, for counseling families for informed decision-making. It helps us to determine the, the modality and timing of delivery. So babies who are very, very sick and might need ECMO and an urgent transport, we deliver at a timed um, it, time during the daytime, hopefully morning time, sometimes by C-section. And we can make sure that life-saving resources are available when the babies are born and try to optimize our outcomes. So I'll go through this pretty quickly, but um, all of this is geared towards categorizing CDH babies into mild, moderate, and severe categories. Ultrasound is kind of the tried and true um, historical way of looking at it. An LHR less than one is considered very serve uh, severe and survival is quite low, although this data is a little bit old and I think survival is slightly better than that. ODE, less, ODE LHR of less than 25% is also um, portends a very low survival. People have studied liver position and stomach position, and just really what to know about that is that if the liver's up and the stomach is up, those also um, portend worse prognoses. We heavily rely on fetal MRIs here um, in our program. It's highly accurate at measuring fetal lung volume, and you don't have to know the nuances of all these calculations, but basically all of these calculations are geared towards looking at hypoplasia and how much lung volume the fetus actually has. And so on this slide, you can see a nice picture of an MRI um, where you can see the stomach, which is white up and intestines next to it. You can see a little triangle of left lung and then the right lung. And this is a really posterior cut, so you're seeing the whole right lung on that side. But if you looked at more anterior cuts, you would see the mediastinum machine shifted all the way into the right, and you can really see that there's quite profound ipsilateral and contralateral hypoplasia. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about postnatal prediction tools because um, some of these things have been debunked recently, and I think it's important to just mention them. Um, 
easy to understand is we do an interoperative assessment of, of the defect size in when we're doing the repair of the um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And this we use really more for research and um, risk stratification and retrospective studies. But several institutions have come up with um, severity index equations. And historically, um, institutions, because the survival rate in CDH, especially in the most severe population, is, is so dismal, there are babies that um, are not always offered full care. And so these index equations are supposed to help one choose between which babies you offer ECMO and which babies you don't. And, um, and so I'm going to talk about some of these um, in the proceedings in the um, following slides. We do not use these equations here. Um, in the past, we have had um, babies who have been deemed too sick to transfer from UW NICU to Seattle Children's. And most of the time it's based on, um, you know, not achieving a certain pH or being deemed too unstable to transport. And so even in our institution up until about two years ago, we, we would have babies that we would not transport and they would receive comfort care at University of Washington. Um, and before I talk, go into the um, index equations, I just want to spend a really sh brief time talking about um, the CDH study group. So the CDH study group is a cohort of over 80 institutions that supplies data to this um, consortium on um, all aspects of um, CDH patients. It collects, it, it has um, a registry of over 10,000 CDH patients and it makes it possible to do large volume studies um, where previously we were dealing with uh, single institution outcome studies, which um, are very hard to interpret because there's such a wide variation in practices amongst institutions. And so using this study group, which comes out of UT Houston and is run, uh, run by Matt Harding, we're able to look at large numbers of CDH and we're looking, we're looking at um, a lot of minutia. So all of the prenatal imaging is loaded into this database, um, all of the first gases, all of the echoes, et cetera, all go into this database. And so we're looking at thousands and thousands of patients. And it really changed the way we do clinical research in this, um, in this patient population. And so I just am explaining that to show you this very busy slide, but I wanted to talk to you about um, a prenatal prediction tool that was used for decades at um, uh, University of Michigan. It's called the SPHERE algorithm. And basically they were looking at their um, sickest cohort of patients. So what we talked about before the LHR less than one, uh, ODE ex expected um, LHR less than 25%. So, so that very severe group. And they categorized them, they did parental education. And then at delivery, they would have ECMO on standby but would not put the babies on ECMO immediately. They would intubate, do some gentle ventilation. Um, and resuscitate the babies. And within two hours, um, they needed to achieve these values. So they needed a pH greater than seven, a PCO2 less than 100, a preductal oxygen saturation greater than 80%, and a PAO2 of greater than 40%. And if they did not achieve this, they were not offered ECMO and they were offered comfort measures only. And so one of the surgeons who didn't agree with this um, algorithm decided to study it within the study group registry, which is a really smart idea. And so basically she said pass is ECMO, fail is comfort measures. And she was able to get um, cohorts that matched all of these numbers and 300 patients in the ECMO group and 300 patients in the, so in the, in the pass group and 300 patients in the fail group. And what she determined from this data was that the survival rate in the comfort measure group was actually equivalent to those in the ECMO group, meaning that 50% of the time, the babies that would receive comfort measures presumably would have survived. And I think that's a really powerful study because this is something that we can't ever really figure out about these babies. We have a very severe cohort and we think that we can predict which babies are non-survivors, but we really have no idea. And we're very, very wrong actually sometimes. Um, and so I hope that makes sense, but this was a, a very powerful study. It came out in 2020. And I think it really started changing people's philosophy about whom to be aggressive in um, when, when treating these babies. Yes. I know I should wait until the end. No, don't. Because, because of that specific study, I just want to know, in the, um, in the database, was it that the comfort measure, uh, the 300 comfort measure babies actually ended up getting ECMO, 
Yes. Okay. Let me explain it better. Yeah. Okay. So, sure I yes. I didn't show that they survived off that mode. No. Not that mode yes. Somebody wasn't following that algorithm. Yes, because she was able to. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. So she was able to match a cohort of patients that would have failed at their institution based on this criteria. And then were offered full care like ECMO at other institutions and then went on to be survivors. Thank you. This is another paper that I find important. It is a single institutional study, but there is a, a institution out there that sees more CDH babies than anywhere else in the country and actually in the world. It's run by a surgeon who has his own CDH ICU unit. Um, two neonatologists work with him. He's just added another surgeon and he does very high volume CDH. Anyway, he, he looked at 172 consecutive patients over four years. So super high volume and um, took the, um, the most severe 10% of that cohort. So if you're thinking about it, out of 172 patients, the, the sickest 10% should have near 100% mortality. We just said that mortality rate is 30%, et cetera. He was able to show in that database, in that, in those consecutive patients, in that 10%, the survivorship was actually 50%. And if you offered ECMO, or, or if the baby qualified for ECMO based on size um, and ability to cannulate, the survival was actually 60%. So what I really take away from these two studies is that um, we really should be treating every baby like a survivor because we don't know which babies are survivors and which aren't with the caveat that we do a lot of prenatal counseling for these families and survivorship is a very long and hard road. And if they are willing to make that commitment, we will make that commitment to them. But there, um, there are certainly families that choose not, not to go this route. We just don't see a lot of them because by the time patients come to us, they're looking for, for their baby surviving. And so I just told you that, um, these babies are really sick. They, if they survive in this severe cohort, they spend a lot of time on ECMO, in the ICU, on the ventilator. Their hospital stays can be you know, upwards of six or eight months. Um, and so what does survival actually look like for these babies? Well, it's actually a very high quality of life survival. So these are pictures of, of actual babies from the past two years at our institution. And several of these babies would not have met criteria for ECMO. And one of these babies was offered palliative care at another hospital because she had um, a severe concomitant cardiac defect. And as you can see, although the road leading up to this is, is wrought with, with, fraught with um, lots of up and downs and, and lots of interventions, um, these babies end up functioning as um, pretty normal toddlers and are beloved members of their family. So um, what did we do to try to build a program? Um, these are the four things that we kind of thought about in, in doing it. We wanted to build a multidisciplinary team of providers with expertise. Um, we wanted to standardize some of our care and we wanted to try to do some early adoption of novel treatment paradigms. And that's what I'm gonna focus um, the rest of this talk on. And of course, with uh, in the background of ongoing research. So our program spans um, multiple phases of care. And this is kind of just a schematic of all of the phases that these babies go through with their families. We have a prenatal section, the NICU section, the floor section, and then long-term follow-up through adulthood. And you can see all the main players. Um, and we have very good continuity across all of these fields. And then these are some of the things that we've done within those um, realms of care to try to standardize things. So it starts at um, our prenatal um, diagnosis and treatment clinic, and we have a pretty large and amazing team with MFMs, cardiologists. We have a core group of CDH neonatologists and surgeons who do all of the prenatal counseling, and we meet with these families several times um, throughout the gestation of the baby, and we've standardized care for that as well. And then this is our inpatient team. We have a lot of um, dedicated and amazing providers who um, love this patient population and are very, very dedicated to taking care of them. So we have a cohort of surgeons, and um, this is our surgical nurse practitioner, um, Carrie Foster. We have two pulmonologists. We have two cardiologists who specialize in pulmonary hypertension, neonatologists and anesthesiologists that all take part in taking care of these babies in the background of a lot of other people who are supporting um, the care of these babies. This is our clinical team. 
So for the long-term follow-up clinic, um, which in which we follow these babies through adulthood, and I could do a whole lecture just on all their follow-up needs, but we see about 200 patients a year. And you can see there's a lot of continuity with the surgeons and the pulmonologists and cardiologists. And then we just developed this new clinic, um, which is run by our CDH nurse practitioner, Carrie, um, in conjunction with our nutritionist, Jenny Stevens, and Ray Miller, our occupational or feeding therapist, because many of these babies for months are transitioning from NG feeding to to oral feeding, and we want to support the families in that. And so what are all of the novel treatments that we've tried to um, initiate and change with our program? Well, this is a pretty long list of them, and I'm going to highlight the ones that I think are important. But I think the biggest thing is that we really have tried to change the narrative and, and change the philosophy around treatment for CDH. And everyone is really bought into that. And so it started with kind of forming a, a group of four surgeons. Um, so you can see Dr. Rice Townsend, Dr. Dellinger, Dr. Reilly, and myself. Um, and so we are responsible for counseling all the families prenatally. We do all of the ECMO cannulations for the CDH babies and do all of the on ECMO repairs. We do daily, one of us does daily ICU rounds um, every day, seven days a week. We take 24 seven call for these patients. And, and early on, it often means um, being up at odd hours of the night, sitting, changing vents. Um, and it takes a very dedicated group of people to do that kind of thing. And this is all in the backdrop of support from our partners, which basically makes it possible for us to do something like this. The other thing that was, has been a big change for us is that um, we have moved away from non-treatment of CDH babies at UW NICU. And so halfway through 2021, with the support of our transport team, our NICU and our maternal fetal medicine colleagues, we were able to start doing expedited transport of these babies. So if there was a baby that we knew would be severe, we have the transport team available at the delivery time. The time is set by the uh, maternal fetal medicine specialists. And then the baby is um, very briefly stabilized and brought over for ECMO um, as soon as possible. And it's usually under an hour. And in that way, we are able to offer ECMO to almost every baby that, that is born. And this has been a big shift for us. <clears throat> We also um, have changed our treatment paradigm surrounding ECMO. Um, and so in the past, we really have been using ECMO as a very last resort. But um, what we've realized is that ECMO is actually pretty safe and that um, it can be a treatment modality in and of itself. And so during the time um, on ECMO, the baby is able to um, relax their pulmonary vasculature, um, their cardiac function improves, and some babies need quite a while for all of that to happen. And so we've, we've switched our thinking about ECMO as a last ditch resort to kind of a, a treatment modality in and of itself. And using prenatal prediction, we are able to guess pretty well which babies will need ECMO and which don't. So instead of waiting and flogging the baby and turning up the vent and turning on pressors and putting the baby on ECMO at the 18th hour. If we know a baby is going to need ECMO or they're heading that direction, instead of doing all of those things, we're putting the baby on ECMO early, sometimes within the first hour or two hours of life. And certainly um, in emergent situations, if we're transporting a baby over who's very hypoxic or near coding. Um, and in that situation, we're actually putting a healthier baby on ECMO. And so even though it's the sickest cohort, I feel like their ECMO runs have been much safer and less fraught with um, complications because you're starting with a baby that is not an extremis. <clears throat> Um, we've also um, moved towards tolerating longer runs on ECMO. So when people think about ECMO and CDH, the average runtime is about two weeks, but we've started, um, we've started to tolerate much longer runs because we know that, that if we can come off ECMO on lower vent settings with less pulmonary hypertension and a healthier, uh, and healthier cardiac function, the babies do better longer. And so sometimes we will do even um, four and five week runs. Um, the other thing that we've done is switch to bivalrudin, which has made ECMO safer in general. We have much less bleeding complications with bivalrudin, and it allows us to do a repair on ECMO in a safe fashion. <clears throat> 
And so the other thing that we've really switched to at our institution is doing early repair on ECMO. There was a lot of debate in the pediatric surgery world about when to repair these babies. And a paper came out um, recently from the registry that basically showed for the sickest cohort of babies, it actually helps their overall survival if you repair them early. This makes a lot of sense to me. And we started doing this in um, 2020, end of 2020. Um, it's it's something that we're able to do safely um, on bivalrudin with um, judicious use of bivalrudin. We used to have to give Amicar for surgery, which we don't do anymore, and that has actually extended the life of our ECMO circuits, which has been helpful in our longer ECMO runs. Um, we we do this safely. We do it within 24 hours of. Um, of putting a baby on ECMO. And I think that it does a lot of things that help us get off ECMO, um, especially in babies who have very, very severe um, hypoplasia. It gives both lungs um, the optimal space to grow and expand, and it moves the mediastinum centrally, which actually does help with cardiac function, um, especially it especially helps with relieving left-sided compression. Um, and I think it makes longer runs safer from, an, from a cannula position perspective. Uh, we've also become really aggressive about treating pulmonary hypertension early on uh, because aside from the fixed pulmonary hypertension that's present from the anatomy, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of abnormal pathways for vessel contract for vessel contraction that are going on in these CDH babies. And I won't go through this very complicated schematic, but we have a team of cardiologists who specialize in pulmonary hypertension and um, are are very good at um, at modulating pulmonary hypertension with drugs. We specifically are fond of um, remodulin or prostacyclin at our institution. And so we recently have submitted a paper um, through the registry showing that early initiation of prostacyclin actually decreases ECMO days. So we think that treating pulmonary hypertension early on in the ECMO run actually helps us get off ECMO earlier and um, with less pulmonary hypertension when we come off. We, um, we also will use milrinone and sildenafil in, in other situations, but it's something that's very thoughtful and we do a lot of ECMO those almost on an every other day basis, kind of tracking the pulmonary hypertension and treating it pretty aggressively. This is just a quick picture of multidisciplinary rounds. You can imagine there are a lot of people that are in attendance for these rounds. There's a lot of discussion, but we're going through all the minutia of these patients. Um, clinical course and we're trying to get these babies, you know, from ECMO off ECMO um, safely and then out of the ICU. And we have a core team that attends these rounds daily. And then for our babies who are on the floor, who we've gotten off ECMO and out of the unit, we're trying to transition them home. And um, we have a weekly standing meeting. And these are all the lists of participants um, who are all very dedicated and show up every Thursday afternoon at 1.30 to talk about the babies on the floor. And this is where we do all the respiratory weaning and the feeding advancements in conjunction with um, all of our colleagues. And this is run by um, our nurse practitioner. We also have made a lot of protocols, and so I'm not going to go through any of them today, but we have a prenatal pathway, we have a, a NICU guideline, we have an anesthesia guideline that was made by Dr. Siegel, who that um, basically helps us with um, repair on and off ECMO and what to do with the vent, and then we have our feeding and um, respiratory pathway. And so since I've told you all these things that we've done, um, now I'm going to try to show you some metrics that show you what our survival looks like at Seattle Children's. So first, I want to show you this graph, which, which looks really good, right? This is the national average, and we get this from the CDH study group database. So this is all those institutions. This is from year to year, kind of what the baseline national average is for survival. And we're high performers. We're a high performing center, um, and our outcomes look really good. But I will say um, that this does not include any of those babies that did not transfer from University of Washington. So then now I'm going to show you the data, um, including those babies. And so if you look at the gray line, that's really the true denominator of all the babies that we're treating between our two institutions. And we're still a high performing center, but we're not as good as the upper one. And that's because the sickest babies weren't transferring to us. So what I hope you can kind of glean from this graph is that we, we started this expedited transport sometime in 2021, in September, actually. And um, from that point onwards, we actually were having higher acuity patients make it to Seattle Children's, but our survival rate has actually gone up. And I'm going to show you that in a different way. And so 
um, on ECMO, you know, once a baby needs ECMO, they're considered the, the, the sickest cohort. And these are our ECMO numbers over the past uh, five years. And basically it's showing that our babies that need ECMO that are increasing in number. So our acuity is getting higher, but so is our survival. And I imagine that by the time this year's up, we will have had equal numbers of ECMO patients um, to last year, if not more. This is our um, survival with ECMO compared to the national average. And this is just a quick glance at kind of our personal numbers at Seattle Children's. This, this graph in the prior years does not include babies who didn't transfer from University of Washington. It doesn't include Morgagni hernias. It just includes true, true CDH babies. And just for context, um, to be a high volume center, you have to have um, at least seven to 10 babies born over the course, you know, on average over five years to be considered a high, high volume center. And we have nearly doubled that number. And if you and you can imagine that very small increases in numbers actually um, has a very large impact on resource utilization. This is some of our these are some of our averages. I just thought people might be interested in them. Um, keep in mind that this is all CDHs, so from the most mild to the most severe. So some of these, um, uh, like especially the length of stay, is uh, it can be much longer than that, as I'll show in the next picture. This is one of our babies that we treated in 2019 named Wyatt Child. He was a baby who was very sick and needed ECMO and um, was discharged on day of life 105. So based on his prenatal MRI prediction, he was predicted to 100% need ECMO. He had a 40% chance of survival and he was predicted to be in the hospital for 101 days. And so it was pretty close for him. Um, and you can imagine after 105 days, everybody gets pretty attached to these babies and the picture in the middle are the nurses on the floor giving him a bubble goodbye when he left the hospital. And then this is Dr. Dellinger seeing him a year later in clinic. Um, very quickly, this is just um, an overview of our the, our research projects um, and our the consortium, and I won't take a lot of time talking about it, but we're active in this registry, and it allows us to do um, some really good clinical study on these for these babies. Um, and then I just wanted to um, leave you with this, that sometimes um, there are, are, are really hard fought losses. Um, and sometimes those losses happen after months of hospitalization. And so this, this concept is something that um, helps me uh, cope with difficult cases and helps me to remain hopeful. And I actually heard it in a talk um, from Matt Harding from UT Houston, but it's something that we really embrace here because there has to be a future direction slide. I have one here. And so um, with the development of a fetal center as a joint venture between UW and Seattle Children's, we hope to eventually offer FIDO, so um, fetal and luminal tracheal occlusion for babies in the most severe cohort. Um, and this is something that is coming in the future for us. And so I'm gonna leave you with some pictures of our, these are all babies from the last two years um, who we've treated. And, and most of these babies have, have needed ECMO and been in the very severe cohort. Um, so there you go. And I can take any questions. Dr. Stark, I'll lead off with a question um, relating to your uh, penultimate slide. So um, tell a little bit more about what uh, prenatal interventions might be available uh, for these babies that maybe- It helps them just over the- To, to uh, make it so that there's not such a fraught course for them when they're born. Yeah, the, so there was a um, trial that came out about a year and a half ago called the Total Trial, and it was a randomized control study that looked at fetal tracheal occlusion, which um, is an intervention 
where um, fetoscopically you place a balloon into the trachea early on in gestation, like around 24 to 28 weeks gestation. You leave the balloon in, the lung um, expands based on just um, occlusion of the secretions and whatnot, and then you remove the balloon prior to C-section or delivery. And this is this the total trial was done um, looking at the most severe cohort and also at the moderate cohort of babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In the moderate cohort, it did not show a survival benefit, but in the severe cohort, it did show a survival benefit. Some of, um, because survival rates are so broad, um, across institutions and certainly internationally, where in Europe, um, survival rates are much lower than in the United States. Um, there is not, not everyone believes that there is good equipoise for that study, but it did show um, that there is a survival benefit in the most severe patients to doing this. And in that cohort of babies that they randomized, they needed less ECMO and they had better survival. And so this is something that fetal centers do offer to, to um, moms whose fetuses meet criteria. So they have to be very severe. It has to be a left-sided CDH. They can't have any other associated anomalies, which actually um, takes a lot of very sick babies out of the equation because many of them will have a concomitant cardiac problem or a genetic defect, something like that. And, and those babies don't qualify. So even at the highest, um, uh, busiest centers that do this, they're you know, and um, Texas Children's is one of them. They're, they're maybe doing three to five a year at most. But CDH numbers are small in general, so. Yes. I asked the other one, did you ask questions by chat? Oh. Question Yes. Yes. Did anyone look at a comparison of hospitals that have that transport time versus the foreign? Yes. Yes. Um, there is a study that was is maybe now um, seven or eight years old that was done through the registry, and it was done looking at inborn and outborn, and it did not show any difference in survival between inborn and outborn, which is surprising, but it did show um, a much higher ECMO usage in outborn babies, because by the time they get to the tertiary center, they're much more sick, and so they required more ECMO, which you would think would end up affecting the overall survivability, but it ended up not. Um, but I, I, my personal belief is that these babies are too sick to transport, and um, and so often we're transporting them, and there's a subset of babies that end up coming over in extremis, you know, where their SATs have been in the 30s or 40s for that entire transport, and then we put them on ECMO, and I can't imagine that that's the, the best way. The numbers for those babies are pretty small, and so, you know, the, the number of babies that would benefit from being put directly on ECMO per year is probably like one or two for us. Um, but I do think that um, if we could get them on ECMO sooner, I, I believe that they would have better outcomes. And what about putting them on ECMO at the inborn yeah. center and then transporting them? Yeah, so we've talked a lot about that and there have been babies who were actually like, should we try to set this up? Um, the problem with that is it's just like such a high resource utilization because most of these moms actually deliver vaginally. And so we don't know exactly when they're gonna deliver, they get induced, we, the, um, our colleagues and you know, try to induce them at night for a morning birth, but it would entail having the entire ECMO team kind of on standby at University of Washington in the birth center for sometimes four or five hours waiting, waiting for a baby to be born. And then sometimes um, just as babies surprise us about survivorship, they survive, they surprise us about ECMO need. And so we could have all of that ready and then not need to put the baby on ECMO. And so I haven't been able to convince people that that is the thing that we should be doing um, for these babies at this point. So I do have a question from a uh, prominent senior uh, pediatric surgeon. Uh, Dr. Javid is asking if you could comment on the thoracoscopic CDH repair and risk of recurrence for babies that do not require ECMO for CDH. 
Yes, I can. Um, there was recently a paper that um, was presented uh, at AAP from the CDH study group, and it looked at um, all babies that were repaired, uh, compared babies in the registry that were repaired um, primarily with a patch and with um, thoracoscopic repair. And the recurrence rate for thoracoscopic repair was 35%, which is really high compared to our rate at our institution for open repair, which is some somewhere around 3%, so quite low. And so the, I think a lot of that is because across institutions, there's a lot of variability in how people do the thor thoracoscopic repair. Some of them still use a patch, um, some um, undermine the fascia. There, there are a lot of different techniques that are used and a variability in what people will tolerate in terms of tension. And so I think that until there is a, a way to do it, um, that is reproducible and has lower recurrence rates, um, especially in the sicker babies, it doesn't make sense to, to try to subject them to that. But I, I do think that in a subset of very healthy babies, it could be the right modality. I'm gonna use the microphone so people That's online good. can hear as well. We have um, a great question from Dr. Mogul, who first says, excellent presentation and congratulations. Uh, on the outcomes from the CDH group. Um, he's asking, I think, a, a good general criteria. He's asking, are there criteria for institutions to join the consortium and how do you ensure quality control of the data so that the analyses are reliable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there has to be a designated person at the institution who will own the data. So for us, it's our nurse practitioner, um, Carrie Foster, who enters all of our data. And so it has to be a medical person, either a nurse or a nurse practitioner or a physician who's willing to go through all the charts and enter the data. It's a pretty it's a pretty rigorous form per patient. And so, um, you know, I don't think that there's any way for the registry to double check all of those numbers, but they're reliant on um, institutions that participate um, vetting all of that data as they enter it into the into the database is that a and it's it's a lot of detail um lots of gases um lots of echo results sorry Yeah, it's such a good question. Oh yes, of course. Um, I think I think basically the question is getting at when we first started, what groups did we get a buy-in from first, and who who are the most important stakeholders? Um, it's it's hard to say, but um, certainly like beginning, it's always a relationship between the NICU and pediatric surgery. Classically, it's a surgical disease, but we're treating babies within the NICU, and all of them get really um, high-level critical care. And so it's it's kind of almost odd to neonatologists that surgeons take care of these babies because they, they have so much going on at once, but it's been historically a surgical disease. And so I think the first thing was getting, uh, establishing and um, solidifying a relationship with the neonatologists. And then we already had our pulmonary hypertensive um, experts in-house who would take care of these babies kind of like in an ad hoc fashion. And so bringing them in was, was actually fairly easy, especially because they're very enthusiastic about it. And we kind of just grew from there. Clearly like after the NICU, they need pulmonologists involved in their care. And Dr. Ledbetter had established a, par a partnership with pulmonology, you know, over a decade ago with um, Dr. Theta Ong. And so that relationship we kind of built on that and then kept bringing in more and more people. And when you are building a program and there's a lot of kind of hype around it, people will dedicate time to it and um, want to be part of a group. And so most of the people who participate in this program are doing it because they're not because they're getting paid more or they have more FTE or anything. They're doing it because they are dedicated to this patient population and, and we all share the same philosophy. <clears throat> I'm going to ask one last question. Um, you, the, you, you demonstrated how even the very sickest babies um, de deserve to be treated because we're not predicting that well which ones are going to die, but somehow very protracted uh, times in the hospital. 
and you talked about their quality of life afterwards. And we obviously saw lots of great photos of babies, but what are they like? Um, you know, this, the very sick ones that are in a hospital for three months or five months. Um, how normal a life is it when they're six, when they're 10? Uh, what, what do you see in those patients? Yeah, that's a great question. Obviously, it's variable. Um, and so there are some six-year-olds that have had ECMO or even two ECMO runs that we see in clinic that are playing sports. They're not ever going to be Olympic that. Olympic athletes, but, you know, they're keeping up with their peers and they're participating normally in school. Um, and then there's a subset of babies that also have some kind of other genetic defect and it affects their development. And so some babies do have developmental delay, but usually it's because there's another underlying genetic cause. Um, but because babies' brains are so malleable and because they have such a potential for lung growth, they actually end up being quite, quite normal six-year-olds um, and teenagers, et cetera. It takes a lot of work to get to them to that point, and um, they have these little tubes in for months and months and months, but eventually, <laughs> eventually they're normal. Well, I want to thank Dr. Stark for a great presentation. Um, just to let all of you know, we had over 100 people uh, virtual. Uh, we've got uh, over 30 in here, so uh, highly attended uh, Grand Rounds. I think uh, people were excited to hear, hear your talk on this and to see the outcomes of multidisciplinary management and, you know, to see how outstanding the results can be and that they are in our own institution due to the development of the team that, that uh, you and your colleagues have created. So thank you very much, Dr. Stark. Thank you. Thank you.